This is the World Report of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, October 2021. Coming up, recreating the ancient while restoring the modern. Film and newly dedicated historic sites connect people to the past while inspiring in the present. Housing, job training, and life skills. The Church's Transitional Services Initiative gives people a second chance. But first, from refrigeration to mobile pharmacies, the Church's continuing partnerships provide relief and equitable access to vaccines around the world. Since the start of the pandemic, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has joined with dozens of organizations to help quell the spread of COVID-19. In March, Latter-day Saint Charities, the humanitarian arm of the church, donated $20 million through UNICEF USA toward UNICEF's role in the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator and the vaccine's arm called the COVAX facility which aims to provide an equitable distribution of vaccines to communities around the world. Vaccines are rolled out in phases prioritizing the most vulnerable, healthcare workers and persons 60 years and older, among others. Over 100,000 doses of the COVID-19 vaccine have been delivered to Belize, but procuring the vaccines is only part of the challenge. One of the key areas of concern for us as UNICEF in Belize has been in the health sector, especially the cold chain system. The cold chain includes refrigeration units and thermal boxes that keep the vaccines at their needed temperature until they're ready to distribute. Doses are put into syringes and then into the arms of people, some of whom have been waiting for months. If I do appreciate it, I didn't expect it this soon. From Belize to Sudan, from Kenya to Nepal, increasing the trust in vaccine effectiveness while dispelling misinformation has been critical to the global effort. After being informed of the process, Melissa Sanchez received her first shot. This effort has been monumental. Its goal is to make nearly 1.5 billion doses of the COVID-19 vaccine available to at-risk populations in more than 180 countries and territories. It's unprecedented in the history of the world where partners have come together to make this happen and to bring a vaccine which is going to be life-saving to countries all over the world. The donation to UNICEF is only part of the church's efforts to help during the pandemic. The Indian Society of the Church has joined hands with global humanitarian organizations and local governments to provide oxygen concentrators, ventilators, and other medical equipment to ease the distress for frontline healthcare workers, patients, and displaced migrants. In Brazil, the church provided $5.8 million worth of oxygen, as well as medical supplies to hospitals throughout the Amazon region. Local church leaders also met with the mayor of Salvador and donated food baskets to feed about one million Brazilians in need. In Paraguay, the church and local interfaith and government organizations donated medical supplies, shipping containers, and tents that now serve as mobile vaccination centers and pharmacy. And in Panama, First Lady Yasmin Colón de Cortizo helped formally deliver church-donated medical supplies to aid the country's frontline health workers and patients with COVID-19. As the world continues to grapple with the ongoing pandemic, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, along with worldwide humanitarian organizations, will continue to bring physical, emotional, and spiritual help to the world. The Deseret Mill and Pasta facility in Northern Utah, which is owned and operated by the church, is ramping up production of more than 30 products to benefit those in need. Wheat and other foods being processed come from church-owned farms and vendors in the United States. We harvest it and, and store it in silos, and then it's shipped to Deseret Mill, and that's where they do their final cleaning. Beginning in 2018, 
food donations to community charities increased by more than 20 million pounds annually. For 2020, the assignment that we received was 480,000 cases of product, but we end up making 922,000 cases. Plans call for expanding the donations again in 2022. As immigrants face the challenges of a new life in a new country, the church is offering help. It's uh, absolutely welcoming, open atmosphere. In more than a dozen cities across North America, welcome centers are welcoming immigrants to help them live better lives. At this church building in Las Vegas, Nevada, dozens of immigrants are eager to participate in the free services offered. Our goal is to determine what their areas of greatest need are and figure out a way that we can help them meet those needs. Emotional resilience, find a better job, personal finance. It's wonderful to offer a full slate of services just based on what people need when they come through the door. In Mesa, Arizona, Ernesto Cabello is transitioning into the broader community through improved English skills. It is a nice experience getting along with teachers, and they are very dedicated. I've even enjoyed being here as an, uh, a student, an English student. Everyone that's engaged in this process will walk away thrilled, uplifted, and edified because that which they are doing is the work that Christ wants them to do. We are simply here to love Heavenly Father's children and provide the help to them that he would provide if he was here. I'm so grateful. In Houston, Texas, the church has joined local faith and community organizations in providing short-term shelter, food, and other assistance for migrant families who have recently entered the United States. We are all about welcoming the stranger. That is what God calls on us to do. The National Association of Christian Churches is making its 110,000 square foot warehouse available for busloads of migrants coming across the U.S.-Mexico border. And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is there to help. For people coming through, they need hygiene items, some sweatpants, t-shirts, or some kind of shirts, and the kids need to be outfitted about the same way. Uvanti and her twin boys arrived after leaving their home in Haiti. They now hope to meet up with family in New Jersey. The Family Transfer Center has the capacity for up to 500 people each day, providing a safe, welcoming, and comfortable place as travelers continue their journey. Coming up, the church's continuing partnership with the NAACP yields scholarships and opportunities for people in underprivileged areas. And plans are unveiled for the restoration of New York's historic and sacred Hill Camorra. On the week of Juneteenth, a time designated to remember the end of slavery in the United States in the mid-1800s, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the NAACP gathered shoulder to shoulder at the Global Faith's headquarters in Salt Lake City, Utah. We can stand here today as a beacon of light. Leaders of the church have found common ground with the NAACP as we have discussed challenges that beset some of God's children. As part of their ongoing partnership and shared vision, the church announced the funding of educational scholarships to be overseen by the United Negro College Fund, the creation of the Amos C. Brown Student Fellowship for Students from Ghana, and a $6 million donation to encourage service and help those in underprivileged areas. This announcement today can allow us to stand proudly together from various backgrounds, from various communities, from across the country, so others can really say, I see the Christ in them. In a sit-down interview with Elder Jack and Gerard of the 70, Reverend Brown talked about how prejudice can be overcome. We must communicate with each other, listen to each other, see each other, feel each other's pain, and celebrate with each other in times of joy and accomplishment. 
Leaders from Peru gathered in the garden area of the Lima Peru Temple to celebrate 200 years of the country's independence. The interreligious meeting titled We Pray for Peru was broadcast on TV Peru, one of the country's national channels. Francisco Sagasti, former president of the republic, as well as state ministers, ambassadors, and some of the country's most prominent religious leaders also attended. The Hill Camorra has a wonderful history. This is where an angel of the Lord taught Joseph Smith and where he ultimately handed to him the gold plates. With the Hill Camorra pageant now concluded, the church is engaging in a long-term project to preserve the historic and sacred nature of the area, which is in Palmyra, New York. We have the opportunity now to take the Hill Camorra and try to return it more to a natural setting. What we're gonna be able to do now is to plant trees. We're gonna have trails that you can go to the top various stations along the way on the trail where people can learn more about the sacred events that happened there. The preservation and updates to the site and its visitor center will be completed in 2023. When we come back, church leaders share their ministry with the world. And later, the church's transitional services initiative offers people a chance to start again. Having a group of people that are willing to support you no matter what your past looks like was a big thing. The medieval city of Bologna, Italy, has long been a capital of culture, renowned for its rich local cuisine, ancient architecture, and the world's oldest operating university. And the place for this year's G20 Interfaith Forum, held September 11 through 14, with the appropriate theme, Time to Heal. More than 700 people following national health requirements attended the conference to find solutions for world challenges. Religion makes a tremendous difference. And so it's, it's really important to have religious voices at the table in terms of shaping policy. Elder Ronald A. Rasband of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was invited to speak about religious freedom. No matter the culture, color, creed, or country, God's love unites us to stand together to face down religious persecution. Elder Rasband also welcomed yes. other world faith Elder leaders Rasband. in personal meetings My with unity of purpose. It was just wonderful. I legitimately feel that we made new friends today. We're taking the relationships from acquaintances to true relationships. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. And it was a very fruitful meeting as it follows up on the cooperation between the church and ourselves in Sudan. Sharon Eubank, president of Latter-day Saint Charities, also spoke at the G20 Forum about world hunger, poverty, and sustainability. The great benefit of a conference like this is that people from all over the world come together and you, you have all these collaborations. But the real overarching goal is, what are we going to do with the relationships that we develop so that we can actually make life better for the people that are suffering? These relationships are some made in Salt Lake City, some made out in the countries, and our role here was to further them and they'll continue to grow years into the future. Every year, government leaders from around the world travel to Salt Lake City to visit the church's headquarters. They wanted to have a place where they could worship. And despite the year's global challenges, 2021 was no exception. The temple is the center point of our faith. In May, the church hosted a delegation of government leaders from Sudan to meet with senior leaders of the church, including the First Presidency and the Relief Society General Presidency. Most of these are made within the church system. While there, they also caught a glimpse of the church's humanitarian work at Welfare Square. We are very impressed by uh, seeing them helping other people. The Sudanese visit to church headquarters follows an historic trip to the Northeast African country by Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in February 2020. The people of Sudan have values that are so fundamental and so crucial, and they're striving very hard to teach those values. 
have people embrace those values throughout the entire country about the strength of the family. And they grew a good crop of potatoes. The head of the Interreligious Council of Ethiopia also visited Salt Lake City to meet with the First Presidency and to build bridges of friendship. I'd like to have you take this home and share it with your family. During part of his visit to Welfare Square, he was shown how Latter-day Saints donate time and money as an act of faith in Jesus Christ to help people in need around the world. Along the banks of the mighty Mississippi River in the central United States lies the historic city of Nauvoo, Illinois, a city which in the 1840s was once vibrant with about 12,000 residents. It was here at that time that the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ continued to unfold until members of the church were driven out and forced to move west in 1846. After years of restoration work in Old Nauvoo in the late 20th century, there are today several reconstructed and restored buildings that reflect the city's early history. I am so pleased to have the honor to welcome you to this place. Taking in the sights and reflecting on the remarkable sacrifice of these pioneers became the focus for visiting church apostle, Elder Quentin L. Cook. Joseph Smith revealed the principles of baptism from the dead here of dislocation. All new exhibits at the Visitor Center are also now open. <laughs> These structures were dedicated by Elder Cook, who, along with others, spoke before a dedicatory prayer. Our beloved and eternal Father in heaven, will thou bless this entire district to be a place of serenity where thy spirit may dwell. May it forever stand as a memorial to those who built the temple and evoke feelings of awe and reverence for the Savior Jesus Christ and his restored gospel in all visitors to Nauvoo. The University of Notre Dame, one of the most storied educational institutions in the world, is the site of the inaugural Religious Liberty Summit. Sponsored by the law school, it was a remarkable opportunity to observe the religious diversity and unity of the interfaith dialogue panelists, including Elder Quentin L. Cook. We're supposed to stand up despite the fact that it's no longer uh, the politically correct thing to do to be a person of faith. For well over an hour, the distinguished panelists expounded on religious liberty challenges and solutions. The reason we cherish freedom of religion is not to protect government from religion, but free exercise from the government butting in. My plea today is that all religions work together to defend faith and religious freedom in a manner that protects people of diverse faith as well as those of no faith. Our hope is to share with you a few of our own personal experiences to assist you in going forward with vision and balance. Speaking to the young adults of the church in May, Elder Gary E. Stevenson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and his wife Lisa held a worldwide devotional from This is the Place Heritage Park in the foothills east of Salt Lake City. You have a constant divine source of strength in our beloved Savior, even Jesus Christ. The Stevenson's primary message was about the importance of maintaining balance between family, work, the Lord, and ourselves. Our personal challenges may loom as large as Mount Everest, and yet the answer to each of your challenges is to increase your faith. For the first time, a single adult face-to-face -face event was held, broadcast from the grounds of the Logan, Utah Temple in June. Elder Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, along with President Jean B. Bingham and Sharon Eubank of the Relief Society General Presidency, met with single Latter-day Saints, ages 31 and older, to talk about increasing faith in Christ and overcoming life's challenges. Susan and I are delighted to welcome you to this special gathering of young adults. Young adults of the church met with Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve and his wife Susan in September for a worldwide broadcast that took place in the Conference Center Theater in Salt Lake City.
you will always be able to find the answers to the questions that you have and the concerns that you face in your life. Entitled Ask, Seek, Knock, the virtual and in-person event provided an opportunity for single adults to ask questions and hear counsel about how the gospel of Jesus Christ can help in all aspects of their lives. In July, the First Presidency of the Church welcomed to Salt Lake City His Eminence Archbishop Elpidophoros of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. During his visit, the Archbishop toured Temple Square and attended an organ recital in the Tabernacle. The Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America has 540 parishes and approximately 1.5 million members. Up next, the continuing production of the Book of Mormon video series brings the book's crowning event to life. And like a spring in the desert, the renovation of the Mesa, Arizona temple brings new life to the surrounding area when we come back. More than 1,000 actors, staff, and crew members are working together to bring to life the prophecies and testimonies about the risen Son of God, Jesus Christ, descending from heaven to meet and serve His followers in the new world. This is all about you guys right now and your reaction to what you're seeing. I know among the crew there's been a lot of sleepless nights. Just to make sure, are we covering this scene the way we really should be covering it? Is, is, is this going to be pleasing to our Father in Heaven? The fourth collection of the Book of Mormon video series was filmed near Springville, Utah, where production staff constructed an outdoor set depicting a temple in a land known as Bountiful in the sacred text. Being in this amazing set and in front of all the other cast and everything, it, it really helps you to kind of see these, these stories that you've read all your life, see them with fresh eyes in a way. Experiences with the Savior, as recorded in the Book of Mormon's book of 3rd Nephi, include his blessing and ministering to children, healing the sick and afflicted, and calling 12 disciples to teach his gospel. Virtual impressions are very important. People like to read, but they often even more like to watch things. It's a good atmosphere. It, it's just yeah. amazing. Yeah. We love to be here. It feels as though the, the ground is hallowed because what you depict here is sacred. My hope is that as people view these Book of Mormon videos, they'll have a firm knowledge and know that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the world. That's my hope, is that it helps people begin that path. Upon completion, the scripture-based episodes will be released weekly in 15 languages and will be available in late 2022. Approximately 600 community members of the Columbia, Missouri area gathered to celebrate their First Amendment freedoms by running in the 27th annual Parley P. Pratt Freedom Run. These fundamental freedoms are essential to our country, to each of us individually, that protect our right to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. Pratt was a prominent church leader in the mid-1800s who escaped false imprisonment in Missouri. His bravery has come to symbolize the need for religious freedom protections and other liberties enshrined in the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. The sights and sounds of rejuvenation. There was a time uh, where uh, you know, the, the heartbeat was difficult to find in downtown Mesa. But now there's a new pulse. Commerce is flourishing while new construction is soaring. We have a lot of shovels in the ground right now. Signaling that Mesa, Arizona is booming. You see quite a, a resurrection taking place. New restaurants, new retail, new housing. One development in particular pioneered the way. It's called the Grove on Main, an oasis in this arid urban setting. Built by City Creek Reserve, Inc., the real estate arm of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Grove on Main now complements one of the most iconic sacred structures in the Grand Canyon State, the Mesa, Arizona Temple. I've talked to a number of developers who looked at this project as this great start of this revitalization of this part of the downtown. The project encompasses several blocks west of the temple site. This area here is, was a very challenged area. It was a nice sort around the temple. 
just because it was old and now it's been revitalized and it's looking beautiful. Turning a profit was not the main goal of this project. The overall purpose of the project is to protect and enhance the environment or the grounds around the temple. In fact, the church has a practice of investing in areas where its members live by contributing to worthy needs in ways that benefit those communities. We have a significant uh, footprint here in Mesa with the members of the church and the temple, and we felt that we needed to do our part. The project broke ground in 2018, and over the next few years, an impressive feat of engineering took place, constructing the first underground garage in Mesa underneath an existing city street. Two miles of city roads were redone while upgrading electrical systems, sewer, and storm drains. The end result of those efforts? 243 apartment units, 22 townhomes, and eight single-family homes, as well as a pool, clubhouse, and fitness center. Other amenities include a retail bookstore, an ice cream shop, and the relocated Mesa, Arizona Temple Visitor Center. Oh, we also tried to design it architecturally in a way that looks high quality, but is still ties in with the temple. One of those subtle details, the roof lines of the buildings get progressively lower as they get closer to the temple as a show of deference. Not only was new construction added, but where possible, historic homes were remodeled on First Avenue and adjoining streets. Where we can, it was best to preserve the overall feel of the neighborhood. The Grove on Main accommodations are priced for families and students wanting to live that urban lifestyle. The movie Field of Dreams, Build It and They Will Come, that's actually what's happened here. And it happened fast. Occupancy is at 100%. It really is helping the city. We're seeing other projects that are coming up, not ours, but that this is generated because people see what we've done, and now it really is beginning to start that process of revitalizing the downtown of Mesa. Other projects, like the new Arizona State University Satellite Campus, are under construction. And the grid, another living experience to include restaurants, retail space, and several hundred apartment units. We're very fortunate uh, as a city that the church was willing to come and invest in our community create something that's going to last generations, and it's top quality. We've protected this environment, we've enhanced it, and people will enjoy this area for years to come. But that's all part of just being good citizens and participating. We want to bring the house of the Lord even closer to our members. Coming up, a record number of temples is announced. New temples break ground, and prominent temples are restored. We'll take you there. Despite the challenges of COVID-19, the work of temple building has continued unhindered. We want to bring the house of the Lord even closer to our members. In April's General Conference, President Russell M. Nelson announced plans to construct 20 new temples around the world in Oslo, Norway, Brussels, Belgium, Vienna, Austria, Kumasi, Ghana, Beira, Mozambique, Cape Town, South Africa, Singapore, the Republic of Singapore, Belo Horizonte, Brazil, Cali, Colombia, Queretaro and Torreon, Mexico, Helena, Montana, Casper, Wyoming, Grand Junction, Colorado, Farmington, New Mexico, Burley, Idaho, Eugene, Oregon, Elko, Nevada, Yorba Linda, California, and Smithfield, Utah. We have been impressed to modify our earlier plans for the Manta Utah Temple so that the pioneer craftsmanship, artwork, and character will be preserved. On May 1st, President Nelson announced plans to construct a new temple in Ephraim, Utah. The new temple will allow for the continued growth of the church in that area while preserving the historical integrity of the nearby Manti Temple, which is currently being renovated. Since the April General Conference, ground has been broken for eight previously announced temples. In the United States, ground was broken for temples in Deseret Peak and Syracuse, Utah, Tallahassee, Florida, Helena, Montana, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Outside the United States, ground was broken for temples in Salvador, Brazil, Nairobi, Kenya, 
Niafu, Tonga, and Phnom Penh, Cambodia. As ground is broken for new temples, existing temples continue to be updated and renovated. First, we go to Washington, D.C., where one of the most prominent temples of the church is preparing to reopen. The Washington, D.C. temple stands as a prominent religious landmark, visible to millions who pass by its iconic spires. It's inside this building that we perform some of our highest sacraments um, in our religion and, uh, and gives us an opportunity to commit to a better path. A major two and a half year renovation project was completed in 2020, but the coronavirus halted plans to reopen until now. We're so pleased to announce that the public open house for the Washington DC temple will take place from April 28th to June 4th of 2022. Followed by the rededication of the temple on June 19th. Artist renderings show what the interior of the temple will look like when the doors open to visitors in the spring of 2022. Our hope is that both the design of the building and the uh, materials and equipment that we put in are going to be able to last another 50 to 100 years. The 160,000 square foot temple was first dedicated in 1974 and serves Latter-day Saints in Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia. I'm hoping that people will come to the temple and realize that even though we've been apart for the last year, the temple is something that reminds us that we're all connected. We're all together because we're all children of God. We want to help connect people to their community and to their family and to their the best version of themselves and specifically connect to Jesus Christ. As a part of the Mesa, Arizona temple renovation, a new visitor center of the church is now open. We hope that every person who comes here and sees understand that our life has a purpose. Elder Ulysses Suarez of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles dedicated the center on August 12, 2021. The Mesa Temple Visitor Center is designed with youth and young adults in mind, offering an experience unique among other church visitor centers. Guests are invited to immerse themselves in Mesa's rich heritage, learn about the temple, and discover their families in English or Spanish. Displays include play areas for children, a desert art wall begging to be colored, and a chalk wall that invites guests to share their thoughts in response to various questions. Admission to the Visitor Center is free and open to the public daily, including Sundays. More light at the end of the tunnel on Temple Square. Over a year and a half into the Salt Lake Temple renovation project, it's apparent from the air and on the ground construction is in full swing, such as with the excavation on the temple's north side, a virtually non-stop effort. Tons of soil are being removed. So far, the depth is 45 feet below street level, with another 20 feet to go before construction starts on the new three-level underground north addition. This inspection should be completed. Like so many who are working on the temple, Josh Fajardo is passionate about his job. I'm very excited to be here for the, you know, the next couple of years. I've always wanted to work on a temple. It's been one of my hopes for my career. He oversees installation of new roof trusses, a crucial element of the temple's seismic upgrade. Coming down 10, probably out two more feet, four on your cable. Weighing in at 35,000 pounds each, careful and methodical choreography is required to drop the new 90-foot trusses in place. So on a typical project, we would open up the entire structure and we would do all the new trusses at the same time but because we have historic finishes that are remaining inside the temple that have to be protected. Only two trusses are installed at a time. And for a rare moment, the old trusses installed in the 1800s sit next to their modern day counterparts before being removed. A flyover shows considerable progress to the church office building plaza. They're gonna beautify the entire plaza with new finishes. If you're standing on State Street looking towards the temple, the design will direct your vision right to the temple. Shingleton has a special connection that makes this more than an assignment to him. My dad was one of the first people to have an office in the church office building, and now I'm here working on it and beautifying the whole area. High profile jobs like this that are centerpieces for organizations that do as much good as this church do across the entire world are just 
some of my favorite projects to be on. When this project is finished, it is going to be spectacular. When we return, missionaries in Guatemala find a new way to share joy through service. The Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square gets a new presidency, and the first for the Strength of Youth Camp breaks ground in the Philippines. These stories and more in the news. On August 31st, Elder Dean M. Davies of the Quorum of the Seventy passed away after an extended battle with cancer at the age of 69. After serving in the presiding bishopric for eight years, Elder Davies was called to be a General Authority 70 at the October 2020 General Conference. Elder Davies is survived by his wife Darla, their five children and 17 grandchildren. Hey, I'm so glad to see you. In late August, Hurricane Ida made landfall in Louisiana, causing widespread damage and massive flooding from the Gulf Coast through the eastern United States. And within days, the church was there to help. Mobile command centers were established. Water and food were provided by the church's storehouses. And the church's helping hands were on the ground to help in the cleanup. And the way people are showing up and responding, knowing the need is great, has been phenomenal. In preparation for patriotic celebrations of the country's 200th anniversary of independence, missionaries in Guatemala City took to the streets to paint and make beautiful the public buildings in the city's historic district. The municipality's Paint 8th Street Volunteer Initiative is held every year in the city. In May, the Book of Mormon live-action video series was published in 14 new languages, including Spanish, Portuguese, Korean, Russian, Mandarin, Samoan, and Tongan. The Christ-centered video series of the Book of Mormon recently completed its latest collection. Episodes from the series can be found on churchofjesuschrist.org and in the Gospel Library app. The Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square has a new president, and for the first time, two counselors, making up a new choir presidency. In August, Michael O. Levitt was called to serve as the new president, and L. Whitney Clayton and Gary B. Porter were called to serve as his counselors. This is the moment to launch a focused and a magnified commitment to expand the supply and the accessibility of sacred music around the world. Church leaders, civic officials, and friends of the church gathered in the Philippines for the groundbreaking of a new For the Strength of Youth camp in late June. This first of its kind FSY camp is a 24 acre property that will include dormitories, an auditorium, and meeting rooms. It will be capable of serving up to 800 youth on a weekly basis. The youth facility is expected to be completed in early 2023. We are so glad. The annual BYU Women's Conference, held in April, is one of the largest gatherings of Latter-day Saint women in the world. But this year, because the event was held virtually, it was able to reach more women than ever. With an expanded number of sessions over two days, the event took advantage of technology to allow for shared experiences away from BYU's campus. In June, the University of Utah honored President Russell M. Nelson with an honorary doctoral degree in acknowledgement of his contributions to medical science, as well as his accomplishments as a scholar, educator, and religious leader. Before his call to the Quorum of the Twelve in 1984, President Nelson was a pioneering heart surgeon and was involved in early development work on the artificial lung. Wendy W. Nelson author, former professor, and wife of church president Russell M. Nelson, was awarded an honorary doctorate degree of humane letters at Utah Valley University's commencement ceremony in May, where she was also the keynote speaker. The world awaits. May God bless you as you become forces for good. On July 1st, America's Freedom Festival in Provo, Utah, awarded President Dallin H. Oaks for his lifelong work in support of God, family, freedom, and country. As a former state Supreme Court justice and legal scholar, he was honored for his defense of religious freedom 
and of the U.S. Constitution in a special tribute and media presentation at the Utah Valley Convention Center. Latter-day Saints are partnering with the Buddhist faith community in Eastern Japan, marking the 10-year anniversary of the 2011 earthquake and the tsunami that hit Japan's coastal regions. The effort between the church and the World Fellowship of Buddhists has provided fishing nets and boat motors for the vital fishing and seaweed industries workers who are still recovering from the disaster. Though they arrive with different struggles, they leave with their heads held high. When we come back, see how the church's Transitional Services Initiative helps thousands of people become self-reliant. I ended up networking with people, and this one was an actual lucrative job. When I first came and met you, I had left a place that wasn't healthy for me. I had never been homeless like that. and. I remember walking in here with nowhere to go, and I met you, and you just believed in me, thank heavens, that day, and... I did. Yeah, I've never felt so loved and welcomed. Each year in Nevada, Arizona, and Utah, dozens of service missionaries volunteer as part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Transitional Services Initiative to help thousands of individuals become self-reliant. Well, we're glad to help. <laughs> I've seen everything from addiction to severe poverty and hopelessness. And when they hit that rock bottom, a lot of them come here and oftentimes we're their last resort. Back in 2002, three, four, five, and six. Ended up working too hard, ended up turning to some substances I shouldn't have. And so I had to pay for that, about 10 years in prison. President Smith there got a hold of me and pointed me in the direction of the transitional services before I got out. It took a tremendous weight off my shoulders and helped me concentrate on looking for a job or how give me the confidence to get a job because that little bit of, you're at least worth some help. We feel that you're worth at least the kindness of, of feeding, of clothing, of, of caring how you are. It means a lot. Since 2019, Transitional Services has assisted more than 26,000 individuals. In addition to helping find jobs, the humanitarian-centered effort provides general information about community and government resources to increase long-term stability. We are a temporary assistance program looking at long-term solutions, so we are here to help with the food and the clothing and the temporal assistance. But our main focus is to let them know that they are loved. I ended up networking with people, spruced up my resume. Then I got another job, and this one was an actual lucrative job. This thing is going to be kind of my prerequisite is trying to get my depth perception back and go back to school for my commercial driver license so I can be a truck driver. So it's kind of a stepping stone to that path. Having a group of people that are willing to support you no matter what your past looks like was a big thing. Yeah, that's your stuff there, boss. <laughs> I needed some help because I lost my job for almost a whole year. Good to see you so much. Yes. Welcome. So the program helped me to understand better the things that you have to put in your resume, how you have to do the interviews. And then that faith that God will make a way. We always want to leave every individual with the idea that our church and God and our Savior loves them, truly cares for them. Sometimes we go through things in life that you feel you are alone. No, you're not alone. You have God on top of everything, and you have all these sources and all these programs and all these people that they are willing to help you. This has been the World Report of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, October 2021. To watch The World Report online, visit newsroom.churchofjesuschrist.org.